Hello, and thank you for tuning back in to Weather or Not. This week, I'm your host, Kyle Eck, joined by our forecaster of the week, David Guerrero. Now, David, this is the start of meteorological spring. It started back on March 1st, and with that, we typically start to think of more mild weather moving into the picture. Do you have any mild weather for your forecast? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the start of meteorological spring. Sadly, no, because it seems like winter is making its final stand as a winter storm will affect us this weekend, uh, affecting students heading into spring break. Okay, well, I'm very excited to hear your forecast coming up. I also did hear you have some very interesting nature in the news stories. Well, yes, Kyle. So my first story involves deforestation in Africa as a direct result of the lack of rainfall there. And then my second story is a pretty fun one. It's how birds react to hurricane force winds. Well, it seems very interesting. My Nature in the News stories consist of the Midwest weather whiplash that happened late last month, along with the big-time California snow that also happened late in the month of February. Now with that, let's get ourselves into Nature in the News. Scientists at the University of Leeds have found a clear link between deforestation in the tropics and a decline in rainfall. The researchers analyzed satellite observations from 2003 to 2017 to identify locations where forests had been cleared and compared rainfall data in these areas to nearby locations where forests have not been lost. By combining satellite data from deforestation and rainfall, the study showed that the loss of tree cover over the last 14 years has resulted in a reduced rainfall. The researchers warned that if deforestation continue, rainfall in the Congo region could be reduced by the end of the century, impacting biodiversity, farming, and the viability of Congo forests. Tropical forests play a critical role in the hydraulic cycle by helping to maintain local and regional rainfall patterns. The reduction will also be detrimental to agriculture and hydropower plants as crop yields decline by 0.5% for every 1% reduction in rainfall. A decline in rainfall also increases the risk of forest fires and reduces carbon sequestration. The Sierra Nevada mountains in California are no stranger to heavy hitting snowfall, but the Los Angeles metro and the Bay Area sure are. A large area of low pressure slid southward along the California coast February 24th and into the 25th, interacted with a pocket of much colder than average air, and dropped snow over areas that don't normally see it. Local communities near downtown San Francisco saw a light coating of snow February 22nd and into the 23rd. Farther south, Snow Valley Mountain Resort in the San Bernardino Mountains has lived up to its name. Since February 22nd, the resort has reported over 7 feet of snow and has closed its services as highways going into Snow Valley were impassable. Los Angeles and surrounding communities picked up nearly 3 to 6 inches of rain with isolated areas eclipsing 10 inches. While many Californians are dealing with flooding, the heavy rain will prove beneficial for their long-duration drought in the coming months. Seabirds are well adapted to their ecological niche and must survive environmental conditions such as temperature, vegetation, and precipitation. While previous research has focused on how animals can cope with rising temperatures, little is known about how birds react to cyclone force winds. Using GPS tracking technology and analyzing over 300,000 hours of flight data from 18 different species, a team of researchers investigated how seabirds react to hurricane force winds and what maximum wind speeds they can tolerate. The team found that birds living in the windier environments fly faster than the wind to be able to determine their own direction. Otherwise, they, they would drift away. Albatrosses can fly into almost all conditions, while tropical species have to develop special strategies to avoid strong winds. As tropical storms reach twice the speed of what birds can tolerate, the researchers found that the birds sometimes avoided wind speeds at which they could fly in other scenarios, suspecting this is a strategy to avoid going off course. The study's results can help to better assess which seabirds can withstand the rapid change changes in storm intensities in the future. The month of February is known to showcase temperature roller coasters and volatile weather, and this February has proven just that. A wintry mess ensued in the Midwest on Wednesday, February 22nd, as a powerful winter storm unleashed heavy snow and high winds across the nation's heartland. In Minneapolis, over a foot of snow and near blizzard conditions have led to over 1,500 flight cancellations by the following morning. Freezing rain plunged nearly one million Michigan residents into darkness, along with crippling highway systems with a half to three quarters of an inch of ice. The same storm then dealt a dose of winter to the interior northeast and New England late that week, causing travel troubles along the I-95 corridor. However, not everyone got in on the winter fun or woes. 
Mid-Atlantic residents were treated to spring-like weather on Thursday, February 23rd, as daytime highs climbed into the 70s across parts of Pennsylvania and even into the 80s in Washington, D.C., smashing daily record high temperatures. As February came to a close, many Mid-Atlantic residents are looking forward to spring. Well, this weekend will prove to be very active in regards to weather as a winter storm will barrel through the Commonwealth, affecting the majority of the Northeast in some shape or fashion. Starting off with the states south of Pennsylvania, we'll see rain affect the majority of those states for the rest of the storm. But in regards to State College, snow will, be, uh, will accumulate for the morning hours until the afternoon as a wintry mix will then take, take over. And in regards to wintry mix, it is proven that they're very hazardous for driving and flying. So if I'm a student planning to travel for spring break during that day, I'll consider delaying those plans until Saturday evening or Sunday morning. Then as this low pressure system heads towards the Atlantic, so the precipitation changes in the evening as we'll shift towards mostly sleet and rain. And this will continue on for Saturday morning as the conditions persist. Uh, for the morning and then the low pressure system heads off towards the Atlantic and so does the precipitation shifting the cloud cover towards mostly cloudy conditions but the big story for Sunday is high pressure will dominate the area, giving us pleasant and quiet conditions, a great way to start the week. We'll see partly cloudy conditions for State College, mostly, cloud, mostly sunny for areas south of, the, of Pennsylvania. Just a great way to start the week, and I'll be very excited for it. Quick recap. Temperatures will be at 38 degrees. We'll see morning snow, and then we'll shift towards an afternoon mix. Then for Friday night, we'll see temperatures at 34 degrees. The mix will then convert to rain as that low pressure system starts to head towards the northeast. Then for Saturday, temperatures will rise to 42 degrees. Morning showers, then as that low pressure system heads towards the Atlantic, so does the precipitation, then we'll convert to mostly cloudy conditions. And these mostly cloudy conditions will persist for Saturday night as temperatures will drop to 30 degrees, mostly cloudy. And then the day that I'm very excited for, Sunday, temperatures will be at 46 degrees, mostly sunny as high pressure will drive out most of the cloud cover. It'll be a great way to take a break from the precipitation from the days before. So if you're still here, I'll go to Old Main, read a book or take a run as Dennis Krulov has a feature regarding weather and running. Stay tuned. Running is one of the most simple sports with nearly 60 million Americans or roughly 15% of the U.S. population participate in running. After all, you just need a comfortable pair of shoes and a motivational music playlist. However, with the majority of running occurring outdoors, as to no surprise, weather conditions play a major role in the quality of each run. In this feature, I will dig deeper into which conditions are suited the best for running and even include some opinions of runners here on the Penn State campus. The major weather component is the temperature. The human body best performs at temperatures at or below 104 degrees Fahrenheit with the potential for illness and fatigue to occur if it is warmer. Professor John Brewer, head of applied sciences at St. Mary's University in London, discovered that running in 75 degree Fahrenheit led to a worse performance compared to running in 45 degree Fahrenheit. He has also discovered running in lower temperatures is better for the heart, you are more likely to be hydrated, and running in the cold keeps your body warm. When running in the warmth, your body warms up much quicker, which can lead to heat exhaustion and possibly heat stroke. I asked a few runners of whether they would run in 80 degree Fahrenheit or 20 degree Fahrenheit and why. 80 degree weather, just because running in like, temperatures below freezing, it's just so cold. I would choose 80 because in 20 degree Fahrenheit weather, um, you know, to keep yourself warm, you're wearing all these layers. I think I'd have to go with uh, 20 degrees. Um, it obviously depends on humidity, but I think uh, in 20 degrees, you can layer up as much as you want. I prefer running in 20 degree weather because you can always take off layers. Secondly, the humidity levels play a large role in running. Humidity plays a large role in outdoor exercise because as your body is warm through the exercise, the sweat glands produce droplets to cool down your body naturally. In drier conditions, these droplets evaporate quickly and cool you down. 
In higher humidity settings, these droplets do not evaporate and you end up overheating your body. Research has shown that hot and humid conditions were more dangerous compared to hot and dry. John Davis from RunnersConnect.com states how a higher level of humidity leads to a higher heart rate and may make running difficult and possibly life-threatening. The same runners were asked if they would prefer running in a higher dew point or higher humidity versus a lower dew point or a lower humidity. Definitely a lower dew point just because when you're running, if it's if the air is like stupid, honestly, it's a bit harder to breathe out. I think I'm gonna have to go with a 30 degree dew point uh, just because definitely a lot more comfortable. In general, runners do not like humidity. It makes you sweat more um, and it's just more uncomfortable to run like that. So if you're outside, low humidity is better. The difference is inside because as any runner who knows who runs indoor track knows, indoor tracks are very dry and that is not fun. Um, so outside, low humidity is better. Low humidity just because running in humid temperatures is so awful and unbearable. And, like you, you step outside and you start running and you're sweating in like 30 seconds. Another component of the possible impactful weather that doesn't include precipitation or temperatures or humidity is the wind. Even if you're walking and strolling around, you can feel the effects of wind slowing down your walk. Well, the same occurs in running. The stronger the wind, the greater the resistance on your body therefore slowing you down and making you use up more energy to maintain the same speed. From runningforsweets.com, it shows just a 15 mile per hour wind may slow your pace by 30 to 45 seconds per mile, which is pretty significant. Wind. Wind is the worst possible condition for running. Especially if you have a headwind. Um, you know, if you're doing a track workout or anything and it's windy, your performance is going to be a lot lower. So Lastly, everyone was asked to state their perfect running weather condition. I would probably say 50s to 60s, sunny, and then like a dew point like around 40-ish. Sunny skies, no wind, no humidity, but maybe 52 degrees. 50 and 60 degrees, if there could be one cloud in the sky. Low to mid 50s and sunny. As to no surprise, everyone say it's sunny skies, low humidity, and calm winds, which all fit the condition of a perfect run. For whether or not, I'm Dennis Krulov. Well, this weekend will still be very active in regards to weather as a winter storm will bombard the state on Friday, giving us a wintry mix for the majority of the day. Temperatures will be at 38 degrees. And like I said, with the wintry mix, it will be very hazardous for travel and morning commute. So take that in account. Then for Saturday morning showers, but it, as that low pressure system heads towards the Atlantic, so does the morning showers, converting it towards mostly cloudy conditions. Temperatures will rise to 42 degrees. Then for Sunday, my favorite, High pressure will dominate, giving us mostly sunny and very beautiful conditions. A great way to start the week. And then as we head towards next week, the theme will be mostly dry and cool. Monday, we'll see mostly sunny conditions, and then we'll see isolated rain showers. But for the rest of the week, uh, there'll be a lack of precipitation. And also with temperatures, temperatures will decrease as the days go by. With the lowest temperature uh, will be on Thursday, with it being 38 degrees. Friday, temperatures will start to rebound, but it will still be considered below average for the start of March. Thank you for your forecast, David. Now we get ourselves into our Weather Whiz Quiz question of the week. This week's Weather Whiz Quiz question is, when does meteorological spring start? Is it A, March 1st? Is it B, March 11th? Is it C, March 21st? Or is it D, March 31st? If your answer was A, March 1st, then you would be correct. Wow, David, it's really interesting to see that how we make our way to meteorological spring it feels a whole lot more like meteorological winter. Well, like I said, I think winter is making its final stand, and I just hope for the upcoming weeks that we can see a return of mild and warmer conditions. Yep, and to piggyback off of that, David, our meteorological spring started March 1st. We continue to see meteorological spring last through May 31st, so we have about three months of meteorological spring. That's very interesting. Yep. Well, thank you for tuning into this week's edition of Whether or Not. Stay tuned next week for our next show. Have a great weekend.